Our Lord and our God, King of the Universe, we praise your name and thank you, Lord, for this Shabbat and we thank for your word. We thank for the history that you've given to us and your children and the lessons we can learn from it. And I pray, Lord, that, that their experience will enlighten us and, and help us in our walk with you and draw us ever closer to you by your power and your grace. Speak through me for your honor and glory in Yeshua's name. Amen. Tonight we're going to be looking at the prophet Amos, uh, part one of Amos, it, uh, several chapters. We'll be looking at chapters one through three, or a portion of that. Uh, let's get a little background. I want to start in 2 Kings chapter 14, as we've been talking about the various different kings of Israel and Judah. It says, in the 15th year of Amaziah, king of Judah, Jeroboam, a king of Israel, became king in Samaria, and he reigned 41 years, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Okay, so the so Jeroboam comes the king of Israel in the north during the 15th year of Amaziah in the south. And Jeroboam, this is the second Jeroboam, there was a first Jeroboam uh, in Israel. And this Jeroboam, the second one, he restored the territory of Israel from the entrance of Hamatha to the Dead Sea of Arbath, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he had spoken to his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, right? And so we saw that. We did a little bit of study on, on Jeroboam and how God used him in a mighty way in expanding the kingdom of Israel, even through a prophecy of one of God's prophets, Jonah. And then we went into the study of the book of Jonah as a result of that. And, uh, and so we're just reviewing that a little bit. And so here we see in the dark green in the middle uh, is Israel prior to Jeroboam becoming king. And then you see in the light green the expansion of the kingdom as prophesied during uh, by Jonah, right? Jonah, the, the same Jonah who got swallowed by the whale when he when he was told to go to Nineveh, and he went uh, in the opposite direction. And so you see, he expanded the kingdom greatly. I mean, he, he was king for a long time, and, and God blessed him tremendously. Although it still says that he did evil in the sight of the Lord, right? And that's the sad thing, and that's what's going to be on his record uh, in heaven. And, and so regardless how much good someone does there on this earth, um, what really counts is what is said about them in heaven. And so that is a little bit of uh, understanding of, of the expansion there into uh, Damascus, and we'll be looking at that a little bit more. Now also in 2 Kings chapter 15, verse 1, we read, In the 27th year of this Jeroboam, king of Israel, Azariah, also known as Uzziah, king of Judah, became king. And he was 16 year old when he became king and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. Another very long reign. Uh, you know, so 40 years and now 52 years for, for this one. So very long reigns. I mean, could you imagine having a president for 52 years? You know, I mean, uh, the same one. So uh, now, fortunately, it goes on and says, Uzziah did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. And so you have two du uh, duplicate reigns of doing what was right in the sight of the Lord. And so a good, nice, long stretch of, of good taking place in, in Judah. And so Judah, the, down here, this, this, I don't know if that's what, a, what you call that, magenta or something like that, right? You know, kind of purplish down there. That's Judah. And his realm expands during that time. Also, also almost doubles. Israel almost doubles during this time. And Judah almost, well, basically doubles during this time period, all the way down to, to, the, uh, to a lot down at the Red Sea and, and out through uh, to the Mediterranean Sea. And so really expands its borders uh, and then gets two coastal lines uh, and so real good expansion. Uh, back as it was in the time of Solomon, actually this whole realm here, the green and the magenta was what uh, Solomon and even broader that Solomon uh, ruled over. Now that brings in Amos because it says the words of Amos in Amos chapter 1 verse 1, the words of Amos who was among the sheep breeders of Chekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah king of Judah and in the days of Jeroboam the son of Joash king of Israel two years before the earthquake. Okay, so several things here in this verse. Um, 
gives us pretty much narrows the time period down, right? So it's during these two kings, and we saw that Uzziah, king of Judah, becomes king of Judah in, uh, in what the seventh, twenty seventh year, I think it said, of Jeroboam in the north. And Jeroboam ran, uh, read, uh, ruled what, forty one years, I think it said. So, so within that fourteen year period of time is when Amos prophesied. So, you know, it's got a narrowed down time period. And then it also tells us that he prophesied two years before the earthquake. Now, Amos writes about eight chapters, but it sounds like he did it all at one time. Now, we see some of the, uh, the prophets, uh, like Isaiah, reigning, or prophesying over several kings. Or we looked at Elijah, or Elijah even more, over several, the length of several kings, over the realm of, reign of several different kings. Uh, but Amos seems like his whole book was written at a specific period of time, just two years before the earthquake. And not just this chapter was written two years before the earthquake, another chapter during the earthquake, another chapter after. It seems like the whole book seems to be written just two years before the earthquake. And I don't know when that earthquake was. Israel has experienced a lot of different earthquakes over the years. We can see that in archaeology today. And sometimes how cities stop being cities anymore because of an earthquake coming, changing things, uh, changing um, spring might no longer uh, flow anymore because of an uh, earthquake. And so we see that archaeologically. But somewhere in that 14-year period of time, when those two kings were reigning at the same time, Amos prophesies. Now, also it says that he was a sheep breeder, right? So he was a shepherd. And not only just a shepherd, but a specific shepherd of, of breeding the sheep, right? And so uh, this was his profession. And God calls him, while he is in this profession, to prophesy, right? So it doesn't sound like it's his full-time work. Uh, he's a sheep breeder. And he, God gives him this vision. God gives him this prophecy. He speaks this prophecy two years before this earthquake. And then he goes back to his sheep breeding, I guess. You know, it'd be hard to make a living off of one book of prophecy, you know, that's given in one shot in time. Um, and so uh, he's a sheep breeder. And so he's a, a lay prophet, we might say, right? He had his, he had his, his, uh, his regular work as a sheep breeder. And he is uh, giving this prophecy and writing this book that God has inspired him to write. Okay? So in our timeline here of the kings, uh, all the way to the left, we had David and Solomon, and then after Solomon, Rehoboam, and that's where Jeroboam, the first Jeroboam comes, and the kingdoms split. And we go all the way down the line, and we come to Uzziah here in the south in, in uh, Judah. And again, pretty good long reign of good years. And Jeroboam, the second Jeroboam up there in the north. And so we're in that time period, and then Amos mentioned down there in the bottom during, during these kings. And so there's, it's on the timeline a little bit, around somewhere in the 800s, somewhere between 700 and 800 uh, AD. Seems to be around the time period that, uh, that this prophecy, this book is being written. So back to Amos, Amos chapter 1, verse 2. He said, the Lord roars from Zion, and he utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn, and the top of Carmel withers. Right? So here's Amos, this, this sheep breeder, and he, you know, no doubt there were lions in that day, and so no doubt he, he ran into some lions trying to eat his sheep, uh, just as David had. And so he gives it, this imagery, God speaks to him, of a lion roaring, roaring out of Jerusalem. And then the pen, the pastors, the shepherds are trembling and mourning as this lion is roaring all the way to the top of Carmel. Now, Carmel would have been, Jerusalem would have been in, in the south, in Judah, but Carmel is in the north, in Israel. And so we see that Amos is prophesying for both, which is kind of unusual. Most of the prophets either prophesied to Judah or to Israel. But here, Amos' prophecy is for both. And so he says it's roaring out of Jerusalem, but it's going all the way to Mount Carmel, and Mount Carmel is withering because of this lion's roar. And the Lord said, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not turn away the punishment they have, uh, turn away punishment, they have threshed Gilead with iron. I will send a fire into the house of Hazel and devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. I will also break the gate of Bar Damascus Syria shall go captive to Ker, says the Lord. Now we've read these names before. We've read about Hazel and, and Ben-Hadad's son and the horrible wicked things that they had done to Israel. And, 
And so here now is a prophecy that they're going to, their palaces are going to be devoured. And that is what happened. Jeroboam attacked up into Damascus. Damascus was weakened from a Syri the Assyrian Empire in the north. And then uh, Jeroboam in Israel was able to use that time and go up into Damascus and defeat Damascus at that time to the north, just as Amos prophesied. Verse 6, the Lord says, For three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. They took captive the captivity of, to deliver them to Edom. I will send a fire upon Gaza. It shall devour its palaces. I will cut off the inhabitants. The remnant of the Philistines shall perish, says the Lord God. It is a clear text saying that the Philistines shall perish. The inhabitants will be cut off. So the modern day Gaza Palestinians are not from the Philistines. Uh, they've moved in there, the Arabs that have moved into that area, but they're not direct descendants from the Philistines. Although that's where Romans uh, got the term Palestinian, Palestine, Palestinian, uh, coming from their version of the word Philistine. But it's not a direct biological descendants. Here's the prophecy saying it was going to be cut off. And sure enough, it did. Again, we saw Judah going uh, westward and took over uh, Philistia during that time, during the time of, of Uzziah. Thus says the Lord, verse 9, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyre and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. They delivered up the whole captivity of Edom and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. I will send a fire upon the wall of Tyre, which shall devour its palaces. And so uh, the Phoenicians, Tyre, up in the northwest, uh, get taken over uh, later on. Uh, at this period of time, uh, the Assyrian Empire comes in and takes them. Verse 11, the Lord says, For three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. He pursued his brother with a sword and cast off all pity. His anger tore perpetually. He kept his wrath forever. I will send a fire upon Timon, and it shall devour the palaces. And so uh, Edom, down here in the south, Judah comes and attacks Edom, and it gets its palaces devoured, and fire comes and destroys them as well, because they did not forgive, because they did not give up on their anger. Verse 13, thus says the Lord, for the three transgressions of Amnon and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. They ripped open the women with children in Gilead to enlarge their territory. I will kinder a fire in the wall of Rabbah. It shall devour its palaces, and their king shall go into captivity. And so Amnon, in, in, uh, just south of, southwest of Israel, gets conquered by Israel. Chapter 2, verse 1. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Moab and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because he burned the bones of the king of Edom to lime. I will send a fire upon Moab, and it shall devour the palaces of Kiriath. Moab shall die with tumult, with shouting and trumpet and sound. This lion is roaring. You hear the roar? For three and for four transgressions, right? For three transgressions and for four, the lion roaring one after another, roar out of Jerusalem, melting away Mount Carmel. And so the Moabites also get taken over by Israel. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah. Now he's coming home, right? For three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. They despise the law of the Lord and have not kept his commandments. Their lies lead them astray. I will send a fire upon Judah, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem. Now that's very interesting, especially in contrast to all the others we've just seen. Because at this period of time, we just read that he is prophesying during the time of Uzziah. And Uzziah is, was a good king. It said he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And he reigned 52 years doing what was right in the sight of the Lord as his father had done, who had reigned for a number of years. And so what's this all about? And the devour of the palaces of Jerusalem? That doesn't happen for another few hundred years. 
So Amos is prophesying into the future regarding Judah. He's not talking about Judah at that point in time. But he's giving a warning. Judah, just as you're going to see to these other kingdoms, just as you're going to do, and just as Israel's going to do, and, and just as Assyria's going to do, if you don't follow the law of the Lord, if you despise it, if you don't keep my commandments, if you get led astray from that, a fire is going to come upon Judah, and it's going to devour the palaces of even Jerusalem. And this is a warning prophecy which does eventually come to pass. But not until way into the future. So it's a, you know, sometimes we read, it just seems like it's bad, bad, bad all the time, but we have to understand that some of these prophecies are not prophesying about what's happening right then, but to the future. And that's why God gave the prophets to give a warning of what would to come if we don't follow his word. And so, Drew Judah prophesying about Judah and again it doesn't happen for another few, a few hundred years before uh, Babylon comes in and takes it captive. So now we I was on Judah and now we're going to go look at what it says regarding Israel and now he's got something to say about them as well and Jeroboam as we read did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord did better than anyone else up in Israel in a lot of ways and God even sent his prophet Jonah to prophesy well about him and he does gain victories but that's not enough for God. And God wants the heart as well. So thus says the Lord for three transgressions of Israel and for four I will not turn away its punishment. They sell the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. They pant after the dust of the earth which is on the head of the poor and pervert the way of the humble. So they're perverting righteousness, selling the righteousness for selling for silver, selling out God's truth for gain. And even this prophecy we see doesn't take place for another 80 or something years after Jeroboam. So maybe you know, close to 100 years after the time this prophecy is taking place. But it does come to pass, and even at this time, they were not following the Lord. A man and his father go into the same girl to defile my holy name. They lie down by every altar on clothes taken in a pledge and drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. Yet it was I who destroyed the Ammonite, Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedar. So God's saying, I'm the one who gave you the victories. I'm the one who worked before you. And yet you're not following me. You're following your own gods. You're going before your own God and drinking wine and condemned, uh, of the condemned. And you're committing sexual immorality. And you're mistreating the poor. And you've traded righteousness for silver and gold. It was I who brought you up out of the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. I raised up the prophets and some of your young men as Nazarites. But you gave the Nazarite wine to drink and commanded the prophets saying, do not prophesy. So in other words, even those among you who, who were wanting to follow God's word, you tempted them to not follow God's word. You tempted them to compromise on the principles of the word of God. You tempted them putting before them what they were convicted was not for them. We say we're seeing some of these same things today. Selling out righteousness for silver and gold or for pleasure, for work, for money, for jobs, for security, for houses, for homes, for cars, for retirement, for vacations. Selling out God's word, selling out God just for employment, just for some gain. Not caring about the poor. Say, oh, we got lots of programs here in America for the poor. Well, not in, poor where the poor, not in America where the poor are. There's a world out there 
struggling in sin and we're keeping it to ourselves. And I'm not talking about the nation so much as, as believers. Sexual immorality being taught even in congregations, even in professed biblical, Bible-believing, Bible-professed believing congregations. Sexual immorality being taught and encouraged and allowed. Seeing some of these very same things. Wine, consumption, drunkenness. Being allowed, even in the house of God, selling out to these gods. <coughs> and then those who do want to live right and do who want to follow God's word, ridiculed and tempted and encouraged, oh, why do you got to be so particular? Why do you got to be so unique in your ways? Why can't you just be like the rest of us? Giving wine to the Nazarites and commanding the prophet saying, don't tell us so much of this Bible stuff. Just tell us nice stories. Just tell us encouraging stories. Just tell us some antidotes and some, some, some funny jokes. Don't prophesy to us. Don't tell us about righteousness and self-control and the judgment to come. Just tell us how nice things are. Just tell us how good things are going to be. Just tell us how great we can become. A lot of similarities. God says in verse 13, chapter 2, I am weighed down by you as a cart full of sheaves is weighed down. Flight shall perish from the swift. The strong shall not strengthen his power, nor shall the mighty deliver himself. The swift of foot shall not escape. The most courageous men of might shall flee naked in that day, says the Lord. We think we're strong in our own strength. We think we're so mighty. We think we're so rich and increased with good and in have need of nothing. <coughs> and yet God's word says we're miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And worst of all, we don't even know it. Because we are so prosperous. Doing so well. And we don't care that fellow believers are getting killed in other countries and massacred and raped and sold as slaves as long as it doesn't affect us here we just turn the channel it doesn't even come on the channel most of the time shut our ears because we're strong we're okay but the strong will not be able to strengthen be strong in that day of God's day of wrath God's day of judgment not by might, not by strength, not by power, saith the Lord, but by my spirit, says the Lord God Almighty. Mm. Trust not in chariots. Trust not in the horses. Trust not in our own might. Trust not in our own strength to overcome sin and the devil. But trust in the power of the Lord. We're so fixated on self-help. So fixed on do it yourself. DIY. Right, we got do-it-yourself stores and do-it-yourself this and do-it-yourself that. So we got do-it-yourself religions as well. We try and overcome in our own strength, and so thus we just overcome to the level of comfortableness. We overcome so that we're kind of like everybody else. And then we just lower the standard as generation, generation comes by. But as long as we're all together on it, then it's okay. Instead of overcoming by God's strength, overcoming to the glory that God wants to do in us, to become overcomers, to become victorious in God's word, to live out God's word, to live out God's truth, and to strive to overcome in the mastery, to master sin by God's strength and God's power, by surrendering our sinful carnal natures at Calvary and surrendering ourselves to the Lord, accepting the Messiah's transfer with us his substitute with us to allow him to take our debt to allow him to take our carnal nature instead of feeding the carnal nature with 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 propping ourselves up with motivational talk and pep talks and telling ourselves how good we are and inspiring each other
Instead, we need the message of God's word that all our righteousness is as filthy rags and none of us are strong. Without God, we can do nothing because the swift shall perish and the strong shall not be strengthened in his power and the mighty shall not deliver himself and the swift of foot shall not escape and even the most courageous shall run naked in that day. It's not in lifting up self. It's in crucifying self. Letting it die in the Messiah and becoming new in Him. Allowing Him to make all things become new. That He strengthens us in the inner man and empowers us from within, from heaven, coming in and living in us. And giving us His might and His power so that we can become victorious and thus we can do all things through the Messiah who strengthens us. Gaining victory over all sin. Gaining victory over fears and angers and lusts and pride and selfishness and greed and gaining victory in Him. Holding to convictions. Holding to the Word of God and walking thereof. Hear the Word of the Lord. Chapter 3, verse 1. Hear the Word of the Lord that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up out of the land of Egypt saying, you only have I known of the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Those of us who know the word of God will be hauled to a higher account in the judgment day. And that's what he's saying here to Israel. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. You only I gave my word for the purpose of you sharing it with others. Thus, I will hold you accountable. And I will punish you for all of your iniquities. Because you knew better. You had the opportunity to know better. Well, how much more in this day and age when we've got the whole Bible and the freedom to read it and to read it on our own. And if our eyes fail us, we can get glasses to still read it. And if that fails us, we can get audio versions and, and CD versions and uh, solar versions and all different kinds of ways the word of God can be read to us and we can hear it. How much more accountable we will be for not hearing it, knowing it, and living it. This generation will be held accountable for God's word and for not sharing it with the world. <coughs> this world is being taken over with religion, but not the religion of the Bible. Other religions are fast taking over the world. And the Bible has been around longer. And we are just sitting around and not sharing it and not taking it to the world. We will be held accountable. And then chapter 3, verse 3. Can two walk together unless they are agreed. This is read at every wedding, every wedding in the world. And it's great for every wedding of the world that's done. Great message for every marriage. But in context, he's talking to Israel, he's talking to Judah, he's talking to all these other nations that he has just spoken about. And he's saying, can you walk with me? Unless you're in agreement with me. And again, in the weddings, we say, oh, can the two couples, can the two people become one? as the Bible says we should. The Bible says Adam and Eve, the two became one. Can they be one unless they walk agreed? And yes, there's a lot to that. But in context, God's talking about himself and us. Can we walk with him unless we are agreed with him? Unless we acknowledge him as Lord God. Unless we acknowledge him as Lord of all. Unless we acknowledge him over us. Unless we are walking with him as he is the head. As he is in charge. As his word dictates. Not our feelings, not our emotions, not what feels good, not what's most convenient at the time. Not what's the easiest path at the time. Not having a form of religion. That's what he's condemning them for. And a form of religion. But denied the power thereof. 
being in agreement with him. Can we truly walk with him unless we are in agreement with him? Unless our lives are in agreement with him, walking with him. Can we truly walk together? But in this world, in this nation in particular, which again has most professed Bible believers percentage-wise, probably more than any others, maybe North Korea, maybe more, but other than that, this, this nation probably has the highest percentage. Certainly the highest number. And yet are we walking in agreement with God? Or are we walking according to our own ways? Doing our own thing. But yet at the same time, professing to be walking with God. Walking around carrying symbols as our profession that we walk with God. God's not looking for symbolic profession. God's not looking for symbols on our cars or around our necks. God's looking for Him in our heart and in our mind and in our lives. Are we walking together with Him? Are we walking the walk with Him? That's what the judgment's going to be on. Judgment's not going to be on the show that's not, the judgment's not going to be based on whether we did the religiosity. The judgment's going to be on did we walk with God? Where God walked. Are we in tune with Him? Are we in step with Him? Are we walking in His way? And we see it often in, in, uh, in Acts, the first believers were called the way. Well, the most often used term for them, the way. She would say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We should walk in his truth. We should walk in his way, in his path, in his footsteps, following obediently and doing as he did. Because if he truly is living inside us, then he will walk the same path he walked when he was in flesh when he came down here. He embodied flesh when he came down here and he's wanting to embody flesh again in us. And he's wanting to walk that same walk again. Which would be a walk of victory and also a walk of self-surrender and sacrifice and quite possibly even martyrdom. He wants us to walk that path, but that's the path to heaven. That is the way, that is the truth. And that's the way to live the life. That is the lifestyle God has chosen for us. Are we willing to live his lifestyle? Are we willing to allow him to live his life, his lifestyle out of us? Are we willing to walk with him? Are we willing to agree with him? That's what, you know, the amen. Means, I agree. I agree with you. I agree with you, Lord God. I agree with your word. But it needs to also be more than just a word that comes out of our mouth. It needs to be our life in agreement. Are we walking in agreement? There again, in marriages, we can see when two are walking in agreement. And you can also see when they're not in agreement. And so we can see if someone's walking with God in agreement with God and his word. And God can see and God knows if we're walking in agreement with him. Then we look at Jeroboam. God was blessing him. Nation doubled in size. Gained victories. Prophet Jonah gave a prophecy and it fulfilled. But he wasn't walking with God. And thus the end record says he did evil in the sight of the Lord. What's it going to say on our record on Judgment Day? We will be judged according to whether we walked in agreement with him or not. Were our lives in agreement? It's going to hold up God's word. He's going to hold up his word. Hold up the Ten Commandments. And hold up our lives. Hold up the record of our lives. And were they in agreement 
Did we walk in harmony with them? Or is his laws written into our hearts? And did obedience come out? So the judgment's going to be based on what we just saw. For three and for four. For three judgments and for four. For three transgressions and for four. They did this. They did that. They didn't follow God's word here. They didn't follow God's word there. So it's going to be based on at the end as well. Righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Verse 4. Will a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Here's the shepherd talking again. Will a young lion cry out of the den if he has not caught anything? Will a bird fall into a snare on the earth where there is no trap for it? Can you trap a bird if you don't have a trap? Will a snare spring up from the earth if it's caught nothing at all? If you do put a, a trap out there, will it spring up and catch something if nothing landed in it? No. No, a lion does not roar when it has no prey. A lion in its den won't roar. It won't cry if it has nothing. A bird won't fall into a non-existent trap. And a trap won't snap if nothing lands in it. If a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people be afraid? If there is calamity in a city, will not the Lord have done it? Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. A lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. That's where he started in chapter 1, verse 1. A lion has roared out of Jerusalem. And Mount Carmel is melting, withering. A lion has roared. Do we hear the lion roar? Do we hear the Lord's message? Is it speaking to our hearts? The Lord does nothing except he reveals it through his prophets. God has given us his word so that we can know what is to come. We can see from what is past, and we can see thus what will take place in the future. As history will repeat itself, as God's word has been laid out for us, we can know what the judgment will be based on, as we've just seen how he judged these other nations. God's word is roaring. Are we hearing? Are we listening? Are we hearing him? Roar out of Zion. Roaring out of Jerusalem. Are we taking heed? Are we waking up? Are we getting ready? Because the Lord is coming. He's coming again. Things are happening so fast in this earth. So fast. Things are happening so fast. There's so much going on right now that we couldn't have dreamed of 10 years ago. Unbelievable. And, and how fast it's happening both for evil and for good. Faster pace than I've ever seen as a believer in almost 30 years. Things are wrapping up quickly. Satan is roaring like a lion as well. But God is roaring to get his message out there. He's calling us to take heed and to walk with him. He invites us to walk with him heard his voice tonight. You've heard the lion roar tonight. There's some area in your life where you're not walking in agreement with him. I invite you to surrender it to him. Some area of his word that would stand out in the judgment against you for three transgressions or for four or even for one. Surrender it now. Surrender it to Calvary. Let Yeshua bear the sin. Let him bear the punishment. Let him take it upon himself. Let him wash your record clean. Let him set you free. If you've been trying in your own strength and in your own swiftness to try and overcome and you've been struggling with the same issue for years on end, stop struggling with it and just <coughs> surrender it to the Lord. Allow him to take it. Allow him to let it die in the Messiah. Allow him to rebirth in you new desires, new taste buds, new actions, new hopes, new dreams. His power lived out.
Allow him to take hold of your legs so you walk in harmony with him. And if we're walking in harmony with the Lord, you can be assured you're going to come face to face with the devil. And if we're walking in harmony with the devil, then we're walking in the opposite direction of the Lord. And we'll come face to face with him as well. Rather, be walking with the Lord and heading on face to face against the devil than walking with the devil and have to face the Lord. So if there's any area, even just one area, surrender it to Him. Stop trying in your own strength. And surrender to the Lord. If you've been chasing money, chasing gain, chasing jobs at the expense of God's Word, surrender it and allow God to provide for your needs. Allow Him to work in your life. Allow Him to live out His life through you. And if you've been walking in his life, walking with him, and maybe walking with him for a long time, and you're kind of plateaued, and you don't see the signs, and you're not hearing the lion roar, wake up. Because things are going to get real exciting real quick. It hasn't hit most of us in our bones yet. But things, again, are toppling so fast. Things are changing in this nation and the world quickly. And soon, it will hit home to all those who want to walk uprightly in the Lord. All who walk uprightly will suffer persecution. And it's coming. We need to be strong in God's strength and walking with Him so He can carry us through that time. So it's time to wake up. Any of these areas apply to you as we pray together. Any sin, surrender it and be cleansed. And your record may be clean. If you're not walking with the Lord, get tight with Him right now. Reach out your hand and say, God, grasp me and lift me up. Bring me and step with you. If you're struggling and weak, ask Him to carry you. And if you've plateaued in your walk, then ask Him to wake you up. And to strengthen you in the inner man and move you and power you on as we pray together. Our Lord and our God, King of the universe. Lord, we're thankful for people like Amos who are willing to step away from the sheep breeding for a while and give your word and give your message. Obviously not a popular message that he gave to Jerusalem and to Israel and to Judah and to all these other nations. Lord, may we hear your voice. May you roar in our ears and may you wake us up out of our slumber. May you wake us up out of our Laodicean state. May you wake us up to the urgency of the hour. And may you empower us. And wherever our fields and whatever we're doing, whatever labor we're doing, whatever occupation, and may we be used in sharing your word. With one hand on the shepherd's staff, and one hand on your word. Lord, reveal to us and convict us any area in our life. Three transgressions or four or even one. Convict us. And illuminate us and let your word shine into our life. And give us the willingness to surrender it to you. To be transformed and empowered by you. Work in us and through us. And may you live on us. Not an alternative lifestyle, but the only true lifestyle. Your life. Your walk. And live in us and through us and for us. Make us strong in your might. In Yeshua's holy name. Amen.